Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you today with me and my wife here. My mom was a little bit sleepy this morning, so she's still snoozing in her recliner. I just um, listened to our governor on Friday. He's extended our stay-at-home order in Washington State through May 31st. And he has a four-phase plan, and we're in the last phase to be rolled out. So we're, it's going to be a while before we can meet in our building again. So I'm really glad that you're joining with me via Facebook Live or later on YouTube. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to be with us. And let's begin with prayer. Father, you are a consuming fire. You set our lives ablaze, ablaze with your love, ablaze with hope, ablaze with joy, ablaze with peace, Lord. I thank you for your promises in the Bible by which we can live and live eternally. Your promise for pr provision, your promise for safety, your promise for protection, your promise for eternal life. Father, I thank you for everyone watching today and for those who are yet to Come and for those who will be watching later on, on YouTube, Lord. I pray for everyone that we would be all well. As we stay at home, I pray for our psychological and emotional health. I know this can be getting to a lot of people, not just cabin fever, but the worry about jobs and finances. And I see some people worrying about whether the government is going to take over. We're going to be losing our rights as citizens. Father, there's a lot of rumor and a lot of falsehood and a lot of deception. I don't know why people do this, but Father, I pray that you would give us clear discernment to know what is true and what is not true. To know what is of you and what is not of you. Your word says that there's going to be always rumors of wars, and yet these are just birth pangs. The end has not yet come. So, Father, I simply pray that you'd bring this pandemic quickly to an, a close, to an end. Let us get back to our jobs and to our lives for people who have lost their work. Pray that you get the economy back on track. But more than that, Father, I just pray that whatever you're doing, whatever you're, you are doing in allowing this pandemic, the whys of it, I don't pretend to know why, but you know exactly what you're doing, and I pray that your good work would continue and that nothing would get in its way. So in the end, all we pray is not our will, Lord, but your will be done. And finally, Lord, once again, I pray that you would fill all of us in our church and those watching, those watching later on YouTube with a great and extraordinary measure of your spirit, of the fruit of the spirit, of the gifts of the spirit. May we learn to walk in the spirit, to be led of the spirit, to live and move and have our being in the spirit, to be filled with the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit in all of their fullness, Lord. We have not because we ask not. So today I ask big, fill us with an extraordinary measure of your spirit. Let the Shekinah glory of God shine out through our lives. So that people might see you and your glory. Thank you that consuming fire will one day consume all those things that we are ashamed of all those ways in which we did good things for the wrong reasons. 
but will be left with a pure and clean life. All the sin and selfish motives burnt out of our lives. No more to remember them. Thank you that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins from us. And thank you for that promise that you will remember our sins no more. Now, Father, as I turn to read Psalm 23 and do an exposition on it, I just pray that you give me the grace to speak. To speak truthfully and graciously and compassionately. I can't do this without you, Lord, so fill me with your spirit. Give us all ears to hear, eyes to see, and open hearts and lives to receive the word of the Good Shepherd. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, welcome. It's nice to have you here today with me and my wife. Today we're looking at Psalm 23. It's a Psalm of David, and he was a shepherd boy. If you remember back in Samuel, when Samuel is looking for the new king, he's been instructed to go to Jesse's house, and they have the other seven boys paraded through, uh, by him, and none of them are to be king. He doesn't get a green light on any, anyone, and he says, aren't there any other sons? And Jesse says, well, there's a, there's the youngest. He's just a shepherd boy out in the field, and Samuel calls to go get him. And so God chose a shepherd, just a shepherd boy, with a shepherd's heart, who knew how to care for sheep, who knew how to watch, their, watch over their every need to be king. And that's just a shadow of the real king, our shepherd king. So let's read it, and then we're going to work through it. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You pre prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So let's dig in. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right off the bat, we see that name Lord again. And I know I did this recently, but I wanted to dig into that again, to look at that name Lord, because it so fits this psalm. And later on, what we'll be seeing as we go further into it. So that word Lord is the name Yahweh, and when the scribes and the chief priests and the priests and the people of the day who were leading the nation of Israel in worship, when they would come in the scrolls to this name, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, -H, you can see the two H's. They look almost like the symbol Pi. Uh, and it reads from right to left, Y-H-W-H. -H. When they would come to this name, they would not, not pronounce it because they did not want to profane it. They didn't even want to get close to taking God's name in vain, following those commandments at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. So instead of reading Yahweh, they would read Adonai, which is Hebrew for, for Lord. When the translators of the Greek Old Testament came along, they used the word Kyrios, which is Greek for Lord. So anytime they would come upon this name Yahweh, which we really don't know how to pronounce it, there's been some other attempts, like Jehovah is an attempt at uh, transliterating it. When they would come to this name, they would read either Adonai or Kyrios, depending on which language they were speaking and reading. The Lord is my shepherd. And so that name is explained and revealed in Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 14. So I'm going to re be reading this one more time. And this is right in when Moses is arguing with God. Moses has appointed Moses at the burning bush to go and deliver his people from Egypt. And Moses, timid man that he is, doesn't want to go. And so he's literally arguing with God and giving him every reason why, why he can't go. 
So we pick up the story in verse 14. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? What a lame excuse. I don't know your name. They won't believe me. I'm just Moses. And you think about it, the last time he was with in Egypt, he'd murdered a man, which didn't put him in good light of the people. Thou shalt not murder is one of the Ten Commandments. It goes on, it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. And the gist of that is twofold. One is that he contains the power of life within himself. He doesn't need any outside entity, any outside force, any outside influence for his life to continue. He is the author of life. He is life itself. And secondly, it's the connotation, it's the meaning that he is always with his people. I am who I am. It has that flavor to it. And he said, say this to my people, pe say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. The I am has sent me to you. We read on. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. That word God there is Elohim all the way through. But that name Lord, L-O-R-D, here we go, Yahweh, and that's connected in, this, in these verses. It's directly connected with the name I am who I am. I am. And some scholars think that I am is the verbal form and this is the noun form. Uh, we really don't know, but they're directly connected. It, they're, they're one in the same name. The I am, Yahweh, the Lord. This is my name forever. This is still his name and will be his name throughout all eternity, Yahweh. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So then we get to the New Testament, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd. Well, who is this guy? Who is the shepherd? And I read in John 8, verses 51 through 59, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And within the Gospel of John, keeping his word, we'll see this in a minute, but keeping his word is nothing less than believing in Jesus and trusting your life to him, believing that he is the Messiah and that he is God in the flesh. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, if I glorify myself my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say that he is your God. Oof. He's getting at, at, at this reality that they're the ones purporting to worship God. But when God shows up in the flesh, in the mystery of the Trinity, in the person of Jesus, they don't even recognize the God they say they're worshiping. But you have not known him. I know him. If I said I do not know him, I should be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. I thought about that. When did Abraham rejoice to see the day of Jesus? Likely on Mount Moriah when he was offering up his son. And the angel appeared and said, gave him the, the not the angel, but they, he found the lamb in the thicket. I guess an angel did appear. And he found the ram in the thicket. But he had said, God will provide the lamb. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day, he saw it and was glad. The Jews then said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Ridiculous, ludicrous. What are you saying, Jesus? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And there he pronounces that he is the I am, the Lord, Yahweh. He is the I am who I am, Yahweh in the flesh, clothed in humanity, clothed in human, in a human body. Completely human and yet completely God. So they took up stones to throw at him because they 
understood his meaning clearly, that he had just blasphemed, blasphemed according to their perspective. He had just claimed to be God, and the penalty of that was to be stoned. They never actually entertained the idea that he actually was God in the flesh. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. You can't stone Jesus, who is God in the flesh, unless it's his time to offer up his life. Then we have the Lord is my shepherd. So we know that this Lord is Jesus. And so my intent now is to look at the life of Jesus. It can take a little bit of time, so I hope you have a nice cup of coffee or something. But the Lord is my shepherd. And so Jesus is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we come across another passage in John, John chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, where Jesus makes this direct claim that he is the good shepherd. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. So only the shepherd of the sheep comes through the door. Anybody else comes over the wall to steal the sheep, to kill the sheep, to eat the sheep, whatever. And then he says this remarkable thing. To him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leaves, leads them out. We are his sheep. He calls us by name and le leads us out into the world. He goes out before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. I have come to know his sweet voice, his tender voice in my life. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. In that day, shepherds, they could actually div divide out multiple flocks by just calling their sheep, and the sheep would come to them out of a larger flock of sheep, maybe grazing in a, in a hillside or whatever. And in that day, instead of driving from uh, behind the sheep, they would they would lead the sheep and the sheep would just follow them. This figure Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. These are the leaders of Israel. They're supposed to understand what's going on. They have not a clue. They did not understand these things. And yet the, the verbiage, the, the language of shepherd runs all through this, the Psalms into Ezekiel. We find it over and over again in the Hebrew scriptures. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am, and again, that word, I am, he's claiming to be Yahweh, he's claiming to be, I am who I am, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not heed them. I am the door, he says it again. I am the door of the sheep, I am the door. Why does he say it twice? For emphasis. He's... Not only the a door, he is, notice, the door. The only way to get to the Father is through Jesus. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So salvation from our sin, from death, from the enemy, from, from evil, from temptation, from the consequences of sin, all salvation is, is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Satan, that's Satan. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He's always about trying to harm our witness, soil our witness, take our lives. But get this. I came, Jesus came, that they might have life, that we might have life, and have it abundantly. So the whole point of get, gaining eternal life isn't just to live with unending days, but to live in the abundance of life that God gives, the abundance of his love, the abundance of his grace, the abundance of a sure hope, the abundance of this understanding, surpassing peace. And we, start, we get to start living abundantly the moment we believe. And here it is, verse 11 of John 10. I am the good shepherd. Do you get what he's saying there? Jesus is saying, I'm that guy back in Psalm 23. I'm the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm he. I, I am the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. This is remarkable. 
The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the first thing he says about the good shepherd is that he risks his life. He will even lay down his life for them. And here he is speaking ahead to the cross and to his crying out with a loud voice, it is finished, bowing his head and giving up his spirit. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He will even risk his own life even give up his own life for the safety and future of his sheep. Who are his sheep? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, have eternal life. His sheep are anyone who would believe in him. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Those people, and he's getting at the very people who are he's talking to, they don't really care for the sheep. They only care for themselves. The Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, which made up largely the priestly class in Jerusalem. They were more concerned about their place and heritage and power and position than about caring for the flock. Sounds kind of like modern politicians sometimes. He flees because he is a hireling and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Now, wait a minute. Didn't he just say that? I am the good shepherd. Why say it twice? Again, to be emphatic, to make sure you got it. He is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd of Psalm 23. I know my own and my own know me as the father knows me. And I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And he had just said that again, being emphatic that he is about to give up his life. He's about to be glorified on the cross. God's glory is seen no other place as clearly as we see it on the cross of Jesus. That self-giving God who keeps no record of wrong suffered, who never seeks his own, but who seeks our highest good. So now we're going to work through this because Jesus has declared himself to be the shepherd, the good shepherd. He declares himself to be the shepherd of Psalm 23. Both the I am, meaning Yahweh, and him saying directly, I am the good shepherd. So I want to take a look at this psalm through the eyes of Jesus and take a look at the life of Jesus through the eyes of this psalm. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This would generally mean that if a sheep... They can't do anything for themselves. If they fall over, they, you have to stand them back up. Their wool gets so heavy, they can't even stand up on their own. And they'll suffocate over time if they fall over. So on Veggie Tales, they had the sheep falling over and the shepherd was putting them back up on their... David, the little cucumber, was putting them back up on their feet. And I thought, what's that about? And then I actually learned that sheep cannot stand up on their own. They can't do much of anything for themselves. Sheep are very stupid, which is a metaphor. What this is getting at is the shepherd watches over all of our needs. There's nothing we, that we will be in want for. I think of the story in, in uh, John chapter 6, verses 28 through 35. Again, a story of Jesus. Then they said to him, these are the crowds, what must we, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent, that you believe in Jesus. That's the work of God. So they said to him, then what sign do you do, you do that we may see and believe you? They want to, seeing is believing. They want to have a sign. He's just fed the 5,000. That wasn't enough. They need another sign. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So really what they're after is another meal, another feeding of the 5,000. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the bread from heaven my father gives you, the true, or the, let me start over. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not from, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of heaven is that which comes down from, the hev from heaven and gives life to the world. So when he's talking about bread, he's not talking about manna. Manna was given every day, just enough for that day. It sustained the people of Israel for the, through the 40 years of wanderings. 
But he says, that's not the true bread. That was only a shadow, a picture of the true bread, which comes down from heaven. And of course, we see that he's speaking of himself. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Then we won't have to work. We'll just sit around and listen to you and camp out and have a great time. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And what Jesus is getting at, he's saying, I am the manna of life. You can feed on me every day. There will be grace for every day. There will be provision for every day. You'll have just enough of me for your needs for that day and your wants and desires as well. He, come, he who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you come to Jesus, you'll never hunger, nor, nor will you ever thirst. And it's not just talking about physical bread and drink. I know there's Christians around the world who are in hunger. It's talking about something much deeper, that spiritual reality, although he is the keeper of his sheep physically as well. And so we have, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you get this? He gives bread to us and he gives beverage to us. He gives us this living water to drink. And these same, this same verse applies to what's coming. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. As a shepherd, you would find just the choice place for your, your, flock, your flock to lie down and chew the cud. They would eat and chew the cud, sheep would. I believe they were cud chewers. I'm pretty sure they are. But they would eat in the fields, and they wanted a nice place where they wouldn't be agitated by wolves or, or taken out by wolves or bears or lions. They even had lions in that day. And so the shepherd would find a, superior, a secure pasture, and then he would watch over the flock as they ate. I think of this story in Mark 6, 30, 34 through 44. As he, went, as he went ashore, he saw a great throng and he had compassion on them. Everywhere Jesus went, he was moved with compassion for people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Here we have that whole shepherd motif again. Jesus is the good shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the country and villages around about and buy themselves something to eat. I suspect that what the disciples were really about is, we're hungry, Jesus. We want something to eat, and we don't want to bring out our small lunch here in the presence of all these people. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii, that's a day's wage, denarii, 200 days wages worth of bread and give it to them to eat? talking about thousands and thousands of dollars here. And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they had found out, so they did have their own private lunch. And when they had found out, they said five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down by companies upon the green grass. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. Large crowd here. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two small fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. Meaning they this was an all-you-can-eat buffet. They ate to their heart's content until they were full. Jesus is the true manna. You get all you want. And they took up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces and of the fish. 12 basketfuls symbolizing the 12 nations and their 12 representatives and the disciples. We have sometimes a, a stilted view of Jesus. We make him the curmudgeon in heaven. But he's always wanting to give us of himself the bread of life. In that radical love affair with him. In that radical love friendship that we have with him. We always have enough of him. Which means we're always 
limitlessly and unconditionally loved. His grace is always sufficient for us. And those who ate the loaves were about 5,000 men. So there would have been women and children along with them. So we're talking about a crowd of maybe 15,000 to 20,000 people that Jesus fed on five loaves and two fish. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Right now he's making us stay home. Moving along, he leads me beside still waters. The sheep, they couldn't, they were afraid to drink out of rushing water because if they fell in, their wool would get wet. They would not be able to get out. They would drown. The current would take them away. So the shepherd would find a nice uh, sandy beach where they could come up to the river or to the place where, to the lake and drink in safety without fear of falling in. I thought about this. Now, what story of Jesus fits this motif? He leads me beside still waters. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushions. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? The waves crashing around them, over the bow and the stern of the boat. And Jesus is, is asleep on a pillow. I love it. The creator of the universe, the one who created all things, through whom all things were created, the one who holds all things together while he was sleeping, he's still holding the world together. He's holding these disciples together. A little storm doesn't bother him. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. If you look at before, it says... Um, and a great storm of wind arose. I love this. This translation gets it right, the RSV. It was a great storm. And when Jesus speaks, it becomes a great calm. The word mega is used twice. A mega storm and a mega calm. That's actually the word. Into the storms of our life. When he speaks, he can speak a great calm into our lives. I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer a year ago in January. This great storm in my life. Yet he's repeatedly spoke, peace, be still into my life. We're in the midst of this pandemic. It's a great storm. It's ruining economies. It's families all around the world are grieving today. Oh Jesus, speak peace. Be still into our world. May people turn and find that you are the good shepherd, the one who watches over us, who cares for us, who feeds us. So get this. He leads us beside still waters. He stills the waters. His very presence, his very word brings a great calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? He always calls them Little face, it's one word, little face, and I'm in league with them. And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? He leads me beside still waters, and if the waters are raging and stormy, he brings them into a great calm. He restores my soul. This has to do with mental health and emotional health and heart health. Our soul is made up of our mind, will, and emotions, our, our volition, our will, and our mind and our, and our emotions. The Hebrew people didn't separate those out into individual categories so much. That's more Greek thought. He puts my inner life, the turmoil of your inner life, that anxiety and worry and fear. He's the one who restores our minds. He's the... Re one who restores our emotional health. So again, I thought about what story matches this, and I thought about the story of Nain, the widow of Nain, 
found in Luke chapter 4, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterward, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. So the disciples were following him, and then behind the disciples were a great crowd. And as he drew near to the gate of the city, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A heartbreaking story, especially in that culture. This was a woman to be pitied. She was, by that culture's understanding and perspective, she was a woman now cursed of God. She was a widow, so she had already lost her husband, which was common. But a woman had no means of self-support ordinarily in that. They were living in under either with their husband or their father when they were young, or with a hus husband later on, or maybe with a brother. She's already lost her hu husband, so she's a widow and she's been living with her son. He is her sole means of support, no social, social security, no Medicare, no Medicaid. And now the only son has died. And a large crowd from the city was with her. So at the apex of this large crowd following Jesus and this large crowd following this funeral procession, these two crowds meet and we find at the center of this apex, Jesus and this woman. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He was moved with compassion and said to her, do not weep. What do you mean, do not weep? He's dead. I'm left destitute. Women in that day, if they had no male to help, it, it was a patriarchal society. If they had no male, no man to, keep, to care for them, she had two choices, either beg or turn to prostitution. And being of her age, that was probably not a likely choice. So she was left to be destitute and, and a beggar to live on the kindness of other people. And Jesus has the audacity to say, do not weep. But he is the good shepherd. He restores people's souls. And he came and touched the buyer, the, the plank that they would put them on. They weren't in a coffin. They were literally laid out on a plank that they would carry. And the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The one who created all creation with his spoken word. Yahweh is now on the planet. And he says, young man, I say to arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. These great crowds on either side of Jesus, now their mouths hanging open, just shocked. And get this, and Jesus gave him to his mother. What a tender picture. Jesus, not aware of the amazement, not aware of, the shock, all Jesus cares for in this deep compassion of his is to give this son back to his mother. He probably takes him by hand and places the son's hand in his mother's hand. Fear sees them all. Ever been at a funeral and had the guy sit up out of the coffin? Nope. I think the whole church would be, or the whole place would be running out of there. Fear sees them all. This is reverential, awestruck fear. And they glorify God saying, a great prophet has risen, has risen among us. I guess Elijah raised somebody from the dead through the power of God. And God has visited his people. Are they beginning to recognize who this Jesus is? No, they're saying he's a prophet. And by the power of God in his life, because he's a prophet, he was able to do this. And here we have God in the flesh, Yahweh, the good shepherd. I am who I am. And this report concerning him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. He restored this woman's soul. No more anxiety, no more worry. He's restored my soul so many times, I can't even remember them. And sometimes using this very psalm, he puts our emotional life back together again. He puts our psychological life back together again. He restores our souls. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. In paths of righteousness. So the sheep could get off really easily. They'd get into a thicket, get stuck. They could 
go over a cliff, they'd wander off on their own, and then they would, the shepherd would have to go out and find them. They were always straying from the path. Kind of sound familiar? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This one whose name, Yahweh, the one who is with his people, the one who is the author of life, who cut loves and cares for his, his sheep. He makes sure that we're always on the right path, bringing us back onto the path of righteousness, which is right relationship with him and correct behavior, good behavior. We can't do it ourselves. He does the leading. It's his righteousness, not ours. What story comes to mind? The Lord was bringing all these stories to mind. I can't take credit for this. I had a completely different tra trajectory for this. And this is where he led me. I think of Matthew 9, 9 through 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. I'm sure at this point, the other disciples are thinking, what are you doing, Jesus? Don't you know who this man is? And he rose and followed him. Who was this Matthew? He was a tax official. In that day, the Roman government would select individuals or ask individuals from the Hebrew culture, from the Israelite culture, to serve as their tax gatherers, and they would give them the right to charge whatever the Romans wanted for the tax, and then to put their own price on top. They could ask as much as they wanted. And so these tax gatherers were seen as lower than the lowest. In fact, in the day in the synagogues, on the Sabbath, they would read a list of those who had no chance of ever getting into the kingdom of heaven. And the tax gatherers were one of them. They believed that a tax collector, if he started confessing his sins today, it would take him longer than his life to confess all of his sins so, so there was no hope. And of all people, they were traitors. They were people who were using the, the Roman occupation to get wealthy on the backs of their own compatriots, their own people. They were hated. They were, they were the most hated people in the society because they were turncoats. And Matthew arose and followed him. And he sat at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners. Sinners are their goons, the bodyguards, the prostitutes, the people who didn't have anything to do with the law. These were the despicable people, the throwaway people, the bruised reeds, the smoldering wicks. They were violent people. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. Amazing, Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. The Pharisees purported to be well. The scribes and the chief priests, who were the Sadducees, purported to be well, but they were just as sick. They just didn't know it. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Everywhere Jesus goes, he's moved with compassion. He shows mercy to the worst people, to the throwaway people, to the hated traitors. He loves everybody on the planet. I know it's hard for us to think. He loves everybody on the planet. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. They considered themselves righteous, but we know from his own words that they were full of dead men's bones, full of rotting flesh and corruption. They looked great on the outside. They were whitewashed tombs, but inside they were full of death and corruption but they didn't see it, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I'm one of those sinners who, who he's called. He's been leading me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake now for 36 going on 37 years, since he really got a hold of my life. He's the one who does the leading. I do the following. He's the one who decides where that path is gonna go. Right now, my path has gone into this world of cancer. I don't have to fret about it because he's my good shepherd. My only wish is to be on that path, come what may, 
wherever he leads me. He is a good shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Look at Matthew. He was a tax collector, and yet he wrote the Gospel of Matthew. This horrible, wretched, hated tax collector becomes one of the four eyewitnesses of the four primary eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. And he was led into a path of righteousness for Jesus' sake, for his name's sake, for the sake of Yahweh. And then we get to a shift in the psalm. Up until this, the Lord is my shepherd, it talks about he, he, he. Now we move into you, directly talking to the Lord. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. I sure know this one well right now, but the reality is we are all walking in the shadow of death. From the moment we are born, we start dying. And death hangs over all of us. You know, some people like to write, read the obituary. I remember Glennis Anderson at our church. Every day she would be reading the obituary. And when I would come over to visit her, she would take out the obituary and say, I know him or I know her and they did this. And, and the obituary was never meant to be. We were never meant to be living this constant cycle of death. It's not a cycle. It's once has it been appointed for us to die, then comes judgment. And so the sheep, they were vulnerable to wolves, to lions, to bears, to the carnivores that would eat them. They were also vulnerable to their own stupidity, to wandering off, getting lost, falling over a cliff, getting stuck in the brambles and the thickets, and they would end up starving to death. And so for a sheep, life was walking through the valley of the shadow of death. They had no ability to fight off the predators in themselves. No ability to fight off the predators in of themselves. Hmm. I fear no evil, for you, the good shepherd, are with me. Right now, Jesus is with me. Right now, Jesus is with you. We have nothing to fear, even though we're living in this valley, the shadow of death. And some of you as well may be living in that deeper valley of the shadow of death where you are struggling with physical illnesses that may very well take your life. We have nothing to fear, for Jesus is with us. I thought of this story in John 11, verses 18 through 27. We're not going to read the whole thing. It actually is from verse 1 all the way through 45. But it's a story of Lazarus, of, of the death of Lazarus. Mary and Martha had sent word to Jesus. He's uh, apart from them. They have sent word that the, the, the man that you love is sick. The disciple that you love is sick. Hurry, come. And Jesus tarries four days. And he tarries four days to make sure that after Lazarus is dead, he's been dead for four days so that he's all the way dead. He's not mostly dead. Jewish people had in their culture this thought that the life could linger for about four days and a person wasn't fully dead until the fourth day. Think about this in terms of the resurrection. Jesus' body did not see decay as predicted in Isaiah. And so we pick up the story. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary sat in the house. Mary had been the one sitting at his feet. Martha had been all busy with the work of preparing the meal. And Jesus had said to her, Martha, Martha, why are you anxious about so many things? There's only one thing necessary. Mary has chosen the better, better part. But now the roles are reversed. Martha is coming out to him. And Mary is so maybe hurt, we don't know, but she is so grieved at the loss of her brother. She's not going to come out. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary sat in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only you had gotten here in time, Jesus. And we know later on that Martha is thinking the same thing. I mean, Mary is thinking the same thing. You ever feel that way in your life? If only you, you were here, Jesus, things would have gone better. And yet the good shepherd is always with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Mary is, or Martha is asking Jesus, whatever he, you ask him, 
please ask that Lazarus would come back to life. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day, the day of the Lord, that last day when Jesus will return and the dead will be raised first. Martha says, well, I know later on he'll come to life, but what is Jesus saying? Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. He's speaking twofold. He's just about ready to raise Lazarus from death into life. Yet he's also going to give Lazarus eternal life, which he's already given him because Lazarus is a believer, but he will then, his body will be raised to an, in, an indestructible, immortal, eternal body and to an indestructible life. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. And again, I should have capitalized the M there. I am. He's again saying, I am the good shepherd. I am, the, I am Yahweh. I am who I am. And get this, he is the resurrection. In him, death is turned into life. In him, one day this body will be rendered a, into a box of ashes. And I will have no ability to raise myself. But he is my resurrection. He is your resurrection. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the life, the soul life, who has the ability to live within himself. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. Even though he die, I'm going to die someday unless the Lord returns before that, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me, meaning those who are alive when he comes, they'll never have to die. They'll never have to taste death. Do you believe this? What a poignant question. A poignant question that he's asking us throughout eternity, throughout the ages. Do you believe this, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and that those who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? Though he die, yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He's asking us to believe that he is the author of life and that he can give us eternal life. She said to him, she gives the right answer, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, Greek for Messiah. You're the one who is going to come and save us. The Son of God, God clothed in flesh, that he is deity, the one through whom all things were created, the one in whom all things hold together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. And in verse 3 it says, And all things were created for him and by him. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. He who is coming into the world. Wait a minute, he's already in the world, but he's coming into the world in a sense that he's coming into human hearts to those who believe him. For the promise of eternal life. Don't let anybody deceive you. Eternal life is a free gift. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. All we can ever earn our own on our own, the, the wages of our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You put your trust in him. You believe that he is the Messiah, the Christ. You believe that he is the Son of God, God clothed in the flesh, and you are, you are given the gift of life. Skipping ahead a couple of verses, then Mary, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who, had, who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. The creator of the universe, the creator of human beings, who made us in his own image, sees the consequence, the very reality of death. And he weeps. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he have opened the, he who opened the eyes of the blind man had have kept this man from dying? Is that faith? 
No, it's ridicule and skepticism. Then Jesus deeply moved again, and that word deeply moved means deeply angered. Deeply moved again. Came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Just like in our picture here. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. Oh, Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha says, you can't do that, Jesus. By this time there will be an odor because he's been dead four days. Just what Jesus wanted. For him to be all the way dead. You can't take away the stone. Jesus, it's going to stink. We don't want that to be our last memory of our brother. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. But I have said this on account of the people standing by that they may believe that you have sent me. Jesus says, I know you always hear me, but I said this for the people gathering here. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus is so practical. All the crowds, I'm, I'm sure, are all those mourners coming with Mary and Martha are besides themselves. They're out of their mind. They are awestruck, terrified. And Jesus, oh, go unbind him and let him go. And many of the Jews, therefore, who would come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. They put their trust that this is a Messiah, that this is the Son of God, the one through whom all things were created. The good shepherd who would give up his life for the sheep. Do you get this? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Because he is the resurrection and the life. No matter what come may come in my life, I put my trust in the one who is the resurrection and the life. He is such a good shepherd. Moving on, we read, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I was told as a little boy that the rod and staff were used to beat the sheep when they were out of line, so be careful, because Jesus has a big baseball bat. He has a big rod. Not literally, but that was the intent of the message. Well, maybe it was literally. Well, the rod was a very, very thick rod that was used for beating off bears and lions and wolves. It wasn't used to beat the sheep ever. And the staff was that thing with the crook on the end that if a sheep got stuck in a th thicket or had got fallen down over a ledge, maybe caught on a ledge or on a very steep hillside, the shepherd would reach down with that staff, the crook. It's a very long pole with that crook on the end, and he would get it around the body of the sheep and then pull it into safety, pull it out of the brambles pull it to safety. So it was for the care of the sheep and the protection of the sheep, not for their punishment. I thought of this story found in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he'd come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He was demon-possessed, who lived among the tombs People did not live among tombs. That was a place considered entirely unclean, wholly unclean. And no one could bind him anymore, even with a chain, for he had often been bound with fetters and chains. But the chains he wrenched apart and the fetters he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. To subdue him. This man, we're told in the other, in one of the parallel accounts, is naked. He's not even clothed. This wild man living in the tombs, out of his mind. Night and day among the tombs and the mountains, he was always crying and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran up and worshipped him. He ran up and bowed down on his feet. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you do to, with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? That's not the man speaking. That's the demons within the man who are speaking. I adjure you by, by God, do not torment me. That's not the man's voice, it's the demons within 
within the man. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And the demon replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. Legion was a division of the Roman army that had 6,000 soldier, soldiers. A legion was 6,000 soldiers. My name is Legion, for we are many. He's getting at there was a whole bunch of demons living in this man. 6,000 or more. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. They wanted to stick around. Now a great herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, Send us to the swine, let us enter them. Demons like a place to live, they like a house to live in. So he gave them leave, these unclean fallen angels. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, so there were 6,000 demons, or three demons apiece roughly for the pigs. Huh, these pigs were seemed to be smarter than human beings. The demons wanted a house to live in. What did the pigs do when they were possessed, these unclean, filthy pigs? They rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. Sheep seemed smarter than the human beings because they wouldn't tolerate having demons within them. And they came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. Amazing, this man who couldn't be controlled by chains, who was naked, running around in the tombs, wholly unclean. The man who had the legion, and they were afraid. Instead of being thankful and awestruck, they were afraid with fear. And those who had seen it told what had happened to the demoniac, to the swine, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their neighborhood. Jesus, you're too much for us. You've just wrecked our economy. We've just lost 2,000 swine. And he was getting in, and as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Amazing, he wanted to come with Jesus. He wanted to be his disciple is, is the implication. And get this, Jesus refused. I maintain that discipleship is a, lead, uh, is a journey into a, the heart of our brokenness where we find that we're not adequate to consider anything as coming from ourselves. This man already knew that intense brokenness, that nothing could come of himself. But he refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. This man now is being sent to be a witness. And, what, and he went away and began to proclaim it in the Decapolis, the ten cities of the eastern, uh, eastern side of the Jordan River. Out in Gentile land, he went and proclaimed what Jesus had done for him, how much Jesus had done for him, and all men marveled. And Jesus just spoke, and this man was freed. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus doesn't have a... Those are just symbols of the power of God and his ability to bring us out of our stupidity and out of the temptation and out of the evil that we've got ourselves into. I'm such a man. This man is my hero. Jesus has set me free. He's given me life. He's given me a future and hope, a wonderful life and two wonderful daughters, a second mom to love. Your rod and they, your staff, they comfort me. I'm sure this demoniac was greatly comforted now. Brought back to sanity, brought back to a life uncontrolled by demons. Being able to live amongst his countrymen. And being given this wonderful task of sharing his story of what Jesus had done for him. It goes on, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I thought, what table? The sheep... This was still uh, it's mixing metaphors. Hebrew people had no problems with mixing metaphors. Here you have, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Some people think that he's moving metaphors now to talking about the dinner table. No, this was David taking the metaphor of, or using dining as a metaphor for what he did for the sheep. 
So he would prepare a table before them, a nice plateau or a nice field of nice tender grass in the presence of their enemies, the wolves and the, and the lions and the bears. I thought of this scripture, John 13, verses 21 through 31. When Jesus had thus spoken, he was troubled in spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Where are, where are they? They're in the upper room gathered around a table for the Last Supper. He's just washed their feet. Disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One is of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was lying close to the breast, breast of Jesus. So Simon Peter beckoned to him, this was John likely, and said, tell us who it is of whom he speaks. So lying thus close to the breast of Jesus, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he who to whom I shall give this morsel when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after the morsel, Satan entered into Judas. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Satan was trying to take the life of Jesus, thinking that if he could take Jesus' life, he would win, that he could take over, that he could be the God of this world without the trouble of Yahweh being on hand. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. They were kind of not in on this conversation. Some thought that because Jesus had the money box, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. Because he was the treasurer of the group. He held the money box, but actually he was a thief. He used to pilfer from the box, we're told. So after receiving the morsel, he immediately went out and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and in, in him God is glorified. Here at the table of Jesus at the Last Supper, there was an enemy present. Disciples had no idea that this enemy was present at their table. But it was an enemy of Jesus, and by being an enemy of Jesus, he was also an enemy of the disciples. Because not only would he be, be betraying Jesus, but he would be betraying the followers. And Jesus didn't send this man away from the table until he sent him to go to do what he was appointed to do. Jesus prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Who are our enemies? Not human beings, but the demonic forces, the rulers, the principalities, the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavens. Satan's been, he attacks me all the time. I can't fight him off. I can resist him and, and he will flee. But Jesus is my good shepherd. He's the one who saves our lives from the dangers around us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Moving on, you anoint my head with oil. The shepherd would come at the dinner table. They would anoint people's head with oil as a sign of gladness. But they would anoint the sheep's head with oil for any uh, wounds that they may have uh, gotten. They use the oil to cover the wound to bring some uh, healing to it. So I think of this story. On the evening of that, of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were shut where the disciples were, were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Here the doors are shut, suddenly they're locked, and suddenly Jesus in, is in the room. He's come right through the wall. It must be a ghost, and he gives them that time to see his, the wounds in his hands and his, in his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Don't be frightened. Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, so even so I send you on a mission to tell people about what Jesus has done. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. We're told in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, that the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified, meaning his death on the cross in the book of John. And now his glorification had happened. That incredibly loving heart, that compassionate, hesed love of God, made manifest on the cross. It is finished. The work is done. 
And so now he says, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. In the context of the Gospel of John, they're born of the Spirit. They're born anew. Oil in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament, in the documents of the New Covenant, is often likened to the Holy Spirit. So he anointed them with the Holy Spirit, received the Holy Spirit. I ask this for this anointing every day. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Not out of a pride, but because of the knowledge that I cannot do life myself. I need him to be my all in all. I need him for everything in my life. You too can pray, Lord, fill me with an extraordinary measure of your spirit. Ask big. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Luke 11. Moving on, my cup overflows. I get to be under this waterfall here. Hmm. My cup overflows. They'd make sure that there was plenty uh, for the sheep to drink and provision, that they would never go thirsty. I think of this story in the woman at Samaria. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They were half-breeds. They were worshiping on Mount Gerizim. They were heretics. They didn't really worship God. Maybe we could liken this woman to a Muslim of the day. A little bit, quite a bit different, but still that same kind of animosity between Christians and Muslims, between Samaritans. And Jesus asks this Samaritan woman, give me a drink. Unheard of. They would even go all the way down to Jericho, 17 miles, go up the east side of the Jordan River, and then back over to get to Galilee just to avoid Samaria, which was right in between Jerusalem in the south and the Sea of Galilee in the north. For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would have given you living water. My cup overflows with living water. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well here is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yes, he's Yahweh. He's a good shepherd. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Everyone who drinks of this physical water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. And what is that water? The water of the Holy Spirit. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The gift of eternal life. My cup overflows. My, your cup overflows with living water. We move on. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In that day, they used sheepdogs to kind of corral, to herd the, uh, keep the flock from wandering away from the, the flock and into danger. And so I love this. Surely goodness and mercy are the names of a sheepdog. His goodness and mercy come nip, nipping at our heels, getting us back in line. It's not his law. It's not his punishment. It's not his d discipline that follow us all of our life, nipping at our heels. It's his, the sheepdogs of his goodness and mercy. I thought of the life of Peter. In Matthew 26, 30 and 35 and a couple other passages. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I will strike the shepherd of the sheep of the flock. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Here he again, claiming to be the good shepherd of Psalm 23. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter declared to him, bold Peter, versatile man can put either foot in his mouth. Me too. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
In other words, Peter was saying, I love you even more than these because I'm your best and truest disciple. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not de deny you. And notice this, and so did all the other disciples. We won't deny you either. Of course, we know that the ten other disciples ran away into the night when Jesus was arrested. Then in Luke 22, verses 54 through 62, Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. Peter followed at a distance, still going to keep his promise. And when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them, with Jesus there waiting for his trial. Then a maid seen him as he sat in the light, and gazing at him said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, some, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Denial one, denial two. And after an in interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. In other words, his accent gives him away. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. In another parallel passage, he calls down an oath. He swears that he doesn't know him. Immediately while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. And in the stillness of that cock crowing, we find this, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter, both sitting in the firelight. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. How is this? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Satan had asked Jesus permission to sift Peter's life. We then move to after the resurrection. It's on a day when Peter goes back to fishing and the grammar there suggests that Peter is going back to his life of fishing. And the other disciples went with him. They figured Jesus is done with them because all, they all denied him too and running into the night. Peter had denied him. Judas had betrayed him and went out and hung himself. This band of 12 is finished. So they're going to go back to their old life. And then, of course, Jesus comes on the shore and says, have you caught anything? And, and Jesus, when Peter finds out it's Jesus, he throws off his outer garment, throws his, himself into the sea, comes to the sea, seashore and finds Jesus with a fire. A charcoal fire, just as at the betrayal. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter had said so. Even if these all fall away, I won't. And the word used there, people say that this is not, that this is just stylistic concern, but it's not. There's a pattern to this. Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? Do you love me with the kind of love that I have loved you. Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you, a word that meant affectionate, brotherly love, the same word that we get Philadelphia love from, the city of love. Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, feed my lambs. What is he doing? He's reinstating him to his call, to his ministry, to the prediction that he will be the rock upon which the church is built. And on the first day, or on the day of the Pentecost and the Holy Spirit is given, Peter preaches one sermon and the church is born and about 3,000 people come to life. A second time he says, Simon, son of God, do you love me? Do you agape me? Peter said to, to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know that I have affection for you. It's as if he's unwilling to say, I love you more than these because he knows his own failure, keenly knows his own ability, his own inability, his own failure. He said to him, tend my sheep. Denial one, restoration one. Denial two, restoration two. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Now he's stooping down to Peter's brotherly affectionate love. Still a great definition of love. Peter was gr grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I... Phileo, you know that I love you as a brother. 
but Lord, I can't love you perfectly in, in of myself. This is a man broken by his own choices, by, by his own oath, by his own promises, by his own having both feet in his mouth. Jesus said, said to him, feed my sheep. One denial, one restoration, two denials, two restoration, three denials, and here's the third restoration. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow Peter all the days of his life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will st stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. You will give up your life for me, Peter. You will be crucified. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. Get this, all of our deaths have the ability, have the promise of glorifying God in some way or another. My mother who had cancer, five people in our community with church, in our church, or five people in the community with cancer, looked at her life, saw her witness, and came to faith in Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit, but because of the witness of my mother living in Psalm 23 during those days of her dying. After this, he said to him, follow me. Come, follow me, Jesus. I'm going to lead you to the cross and through the cross into an indestructible and eternal life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And then lastly, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The shepherd doesn't leave the sheep just for a time. But this shepherd makes sure that they have an eternal home. A place where we will live for all eternity together and with our Lord, with the good shepherd, who will continue to be our good shepherd for all time. Throughout the ages, throughout the eons. I thought of this story, John 14, verses 1 through 6, this account of Jesus as he's getting ready to go to the cross. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Again, that call to believe. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? So 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to to the cross, and in, in, in and through the cross to prepare a place for us in heaven. And he's been there preparing it ever since. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. I've had the sacred privilege of being at over 30 people's deaths in our church, being present as they went to be with the Lord. And this passage so clearly says that it's Jesus himself will, will come and when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Some people think that this is of the second coming. No, this is spoken to the disciples first, and then to all, all the disciples, all of Jesus' disciples throughout all the generations and throughout all time. The moment of death, we get to meet Jesus. He comes for us. And he'll take us home. I have no fear. I have no cause for fear. Doesn't mean I'm not afraid sometimes, but I have no cause for fear because the moment when I take this last breath will be the moment that I meet Jesus, will be the moment that I get to go home and be in the shepherd's arms, be in his presence, be in his love, living in his grace for all eternity and meet all those who've gone on before me by grace and through faith. And I shall dwell a confident statement and proclamation of trust. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said, I love Thomas. He's real as Thomas. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There are no other roads to heaven but through Jesus, through his broken body, through his shed blood, through his offer of life for all those who would believe. And notice he says, I am the way. 
Not a way, the way. There is only one way. I am the truth. And I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but, my, but, but by me. Oh, that you would believe in Jesus. That you would believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who died for you on the cross and took all of your sin. And when he died, all of your sin died with him. Oh, that you would believe that he is the Son of God, that he is deity in the flesh, that he is God in the flesh, made manifest in the person of Jesus. That you would be given that gift of eternal life. That you would believe that when you believe, he gives you that gift. Lastly, John 5, 24, so clear. Truly, truly, um, amen, amen, said twice. Listen up, folks, this is important. I say to you, he who hears my word, this is Jesus, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. The moment you believe, you are given the gift of eternal life. Not at the end of days, after your death, then you can persevere and you can find out whether you persevered enough to get it. You're given the moment you believe is what this verse is so clearly saying. He does not come into judgment. She does not come into judgment. We've seen that great white throne judgment. We will not have to face that great white throne judgment. Only the Bema seat of Christ, only the judgment seat of Christ, where we will be rewarded and all the bad stuff in our life will be thankfully burnt away. But has passed. This is a perfect tense verb here, which means that it's already happened. The action has already happened. Has passed from death, this eternal death, into eternal life. We've already passed the moment we believe from eternal death into eternal life. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Do you hear his call, the good shepherd's call, to his sheep? You are his sheep. Do you hear his voice calling you, come to me, all who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, the yoke of my grace, is what the early church believed. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Have you been persuaded that Yahweh is Jesus, that Jesus is Yahweh, that he is a good shepherd, that his life fully manifests what it means to be the good shepherd of Psalm 23? Let's read it one more time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I know I went long. I prayed about this. I was going to break it up into two, and the Lord says, no, I want you to do it in one fell swoop. So there you have it. Psalm 23 is seen through the eyes of Jesus, and the life of Jesus is seen through Psalm 23, the Psalm of the Good Shepherd. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your abiding presence. I thank you that you are our Good Shepherd, that we have nothing that we need or want that we can't find in you, that you are the bread of life, that you are the living water, that you are the resurrection and the life, that you are the good shepherd, that you are the door of the sheep, that you are the vine, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you that you watch over our lives, that we have nothing to fear, nothing to be worried about. Even in the midst of this pandemic, you are the good shepherd, and you have our backs. You keep us from the enemy. You keep us from wandering astray. You give your very life for us. 
You gave up your very life for us on the cross that we might live. Surely goodness and mercy, those sheepdogs of good, good, goodness and mercy, shall follow us all the days of our life. However long that, that life is. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever because you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the, this most precious gift of life. Thank you for the consuming fire that will one day completely purify our lives. And we will stand in your presence with great joy, blameless with great joy. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for hanging in with, there with me if you were able to make it through. If not, you, can, well, you wouldn't know this, but you can always watch this again later on YouTube. I'll have it posted on my YouTube tube channel with uh, links to it on our Grace Covenant Church Facebook page and on my own Facebook page. Again, thank you for coming. We leave you with the blessing from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, to whom be glory forever and ever, all glory, all power goes to Jesus, to God the Father, to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks again for coming. Hope to see you tomorrow for Psalm 24. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ.